God is spirit, and those who worship him are <coughs> worship in spirit and in truth. That, of course, refers to being under the filling of God the Holy Spirit. And in the divine dinosphere, the only place where Bible doctrine can be perceived and used. Therefore, before we start our study, we are going to take our normal few moments of silence, which, of course, is designed to give every believer priest both the privacy and the opportunity to make all those decisions necessary for a proper study. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that once again from your perfect faithfulness you've recognized our every need and our capacities and in fulfillment of the plan that you provided for us you've given us yet another opportunity to gather together as a local church to study your word. Then, as a result of its application to develop capacity for life, for love, for happiness, for service, for blessing, and of course to handle the pressures and problems that you know are in our immediate future. We ask now that God and the Holy Spirit would provide for each of us concentration, self-discipline, genuine humility, and anything else we might need for a proper study. And as always, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, our introduction to the Old Testament. We have the overview of the structure and the collection of the Old Testament, canonicity. We have the keys to studying the Old Testament. We saw the Old Testament compared to divisions of time. We saw dispensations, did a review of dispensations. Then we started the books of law, or the Pentateuch, the five first books, uh, and got some overview information associated with the Pentateuch, some isagogics. Then we uh, saw, we started into the book of Genesis. We see that it's the longest period of history. Uh, there are three popular types of outlines. I went through the three outlines. Uh, we went through the authorship and the fact that it is Moses, and there are individuals that think there's some other types of authorships, and, was, and uh, went through why that was not correct. Then we saw some information associated with the na ancient Near East background. Uh, the Gilgamesh, for example, uh, uh, episode of a flood, you know, to verify that there really was a flood, for example. Then uh, literary analysis is where we are. We saw the structure. Uh, and and uh, the structure relayed back to those three different outlines and gave an indication as to why you would want to look at each of it, uh, look at the book from each of those types of outlines. Then we went into the genre of the book, which of course is historical, it's a theological history. Uh, and then we are now currently in the theological message. We went through subpoint little a, which is Genesis 1 through 11, and saw that uh, little creation is actually covered, even though the book of Genesis is called the book of creation, there's very little about the creation that's actually covered. Uh, the main point was that we, God created the entire universe and planet Earth out of nothing, which is different than uh, all of the other uh, ancient uh, uh, religions, if you will, and that God is patient and faithful. <clears throat> We saw advancing sin and punishment, and I gave you uh, four accounts in a table that showed you how uh, that happened. <clears throat> and again, the fact that God is patient, just, and loving. And then creation, restoration, versus the flood. And I compared and contrasted creation, and then restoration, uh, <clears throat> and then the flood, and of course the restoration after the flood. And then we ended with the Tower of Babel. That then led us into uh, subpoint B, which is currently where we are, subpoint little b. Where this is of Genesis paragraphs 30, 12 through 36 and 38. 37 is, is ellipsis because 37 actually deals uh, with Joseph, which is going to be in the next, uh, the next passage that we go through, or the next peak chunk we go through. Uh, <clears throat> we see that uh, this is the patriarchal narratives. Uh, we note that Genesis 11, 27 through 32 provides the link between the primeval history and the patriarchal history, and that it narrates the move of Abram, later called Abraham, from Ur to Haran, along with his father, and of course it was in Haran that the Lord called Abram, or eventually Abraham, uh, and it's there that the Abrahamic covenant was first given, and that's in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. We saw in subpoint 1 that God promised Abraham that he would have numerous descendants who would form a mighty nation along with it. He would receive a gift of land from the Lord. So we had the Abrahamic covenant in this area. Uh, then we saw... <coughs> On the basis of this covenant is why Abram left Haran and traveled to Palestine. The accounts that follow have a consistent theme of the fulfillment of these promises and the patriarch's reactions to them. Uh, Abraham's life in particular focuses on his wavering faith towards God's ability to fulfill his promises. And I have a mark right there. I'm not sure that's the... Okay. Okay, so that's where we're ready to pick it up then. I probably could have gone slower in the review of points one and two. <clears throat> but anyway, we're ready to pick it up then with subpoint three. This is a three with double lines through it. Double lines through it. Gosh, Paul. Uh, three with two parents. There we go. <laughs> I have coffee in here, but I promise I'll go slow. So, 
<laughs> Each of the episodes of his life may be read as a... <laughs> okay. <laughs> so point three. Each of the episodes... of his life, this is Abram's life, may be read as a reaction to God's promises. So the theological message, <clears throat> I'll give you the overview here before I start giving you all the details, but the theological message that we're going to get from this section is that <clears throat> Excuse me. Is that Abraham, uh, just like many of the quote heroes uh, of the Old Testament, was human, and we're going to see ep ep episodes where Abraham is very faithful, and then he's not faithful, and then he's faithful again, and then he's not faithful, right? And then he's faithful, and, and all of that is leading up to him growing, to him becoming a mature believer. Uh, just because he falls out and has weaknesses doesn't mean that he's not, you know, not going to continue to grow. And that's part of the message that we have to have. We see it in these individuals is the fact that we may become carnal at some point in time. And, of course, during the Sunday classes, we're studying rebound, so we understand how to get out of carnality. But the fact of the matter is that God is patient. God is faithful. God gives us the opportunity to uh, get back in fellowship with him, to get back uh, properly functioning with him. And part of that then becomes blessing. So you have the cursing associated with being out of, out of uh, God's promise to uh, being turned to blessing, and that blessing leading to growth. You know, every time you stumble, you grow, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, when you get back in, when you get back in fellowship, because then you realize, oh boy, that was an idiot, I shouldn't have done that, and now you know something you're not supposed to do, right? One of the things that I learned when I was a young engineer is I had a, uh, a very old technician that uh, worked for me, right? And the guy had worked for a lot of, you know, for a lot of engineers, and he knew a lot more than I did, and I respected that, which was uh, interesting because he said he was one of the first engineers that did. Most of them don't re didn't respect uh, technicians. But anyway, the, the thing that uh, the guy taught me, because we, we did something, and it was a horrible failure, okay? And one of the things he stated was, you know, you never learn anything from a successful experiment. How you learn is that what you, what you guessed was right, right? You know, you, are, you really want to learn. Learn from something that's horrible, right? <laughs> because you learn an awful lot more, right? You know, and I learned the same thing when I was getting my MBA. There, you know, they always have a, uh, these case studies, and there's a case study of an individual at IBM that made a mistake that cost the company, you know, a couple million dollars. This was back in the 60s when a million dollars was a lot, okay? <laughs> cost him a couple million dollars, and he was ready to turn in his resignation. And the boss said, why are you turning in your resignation? You know, the company just spent $2 million teaching you something, right? <laughs> you, know, you, be you better stay and learn, you know, <laughs> use what you learn, right? Well, that's what's happening here is we're going to see that Abraham is, uh, you know, he falters, he fails, and then he gets back in fellowship, ultimately, of course, <clears throat> to the point where the, uh, the uh, promises uh, start to come true and he ends up having uh, Isaac. But anyway, we continue on. Okay, so each of the episodes of his life may be read as a reaction to God's promises, period. For instance, comma, When he first arrives in Palestine, comma, Abram encounters an obstacle. Or if you watch, oh brother, where art thou? It's obstacle. <laughs> okay, small class, I guess you gotta have a little fun. <laughs> <clears throat> So, for instance, when, when he first arrives in Palestine, Abram encounters an obstacle to the fulfillment of the promise of the land when a famine forces him to flee to Egypt, period. Genesis 12, 10 through 20.
So he was being faithful. He was told to uh, cross over. He was told to leave Haran and go to Palestine, uh, and leave, his, you know, leave his father and his family, essentially, and go over. Uh, and he did. So he was being faithful. And then, and then when he gets there, he has some of his first wavering because he gets there, and, and then there's a famine. And it's one of those, oh, God, why'd you leave, why'd you leave me here? Right? This place is horrible instead of having faith. Okay? So he flees to Egypt. Continue the point. He obviously does not trust God. To care for him. Because he causes Sarah... So he's married to Sarah, or Sarai at this point in time. Her name hasn't changed. To lie about her relationship with him in order to save his own life, period. See, he's afraid that when he gets to uh, Egypt, that uh, if he says that Sarah's his wife, that he's going to be killed and the uh, Pharaoh will take his wife either as, as uh, part of his uh, harem, if you will, or to make her a, a servant or a slave. But instead, he has her say that she's his sister. Okay? And then they, then they wouldn't do anything <clears throat> okay, to him. So he, uh, he doesn't trust God enough. And so when he's asked, he says, oh, she's my, you know, he has her say that, she's, that he's her brother rather than her husband, okay? Continuing the point. In this episode, we see several things, colon, first of all, comma, One of the, quote, heroes, end quote, of the Old Testament. Is human. And has an old sin nature, period. See, sometimes the problems with, ch with uh, child, children's Bibles is they take these heroes and they turn them almost into demigods, right? They take the heroes and they leave the child believing that uh, this person can walk on water, just like the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That these individuals are infallible, that they are somehow different from us. When, in fact, the doctrinal uh, uh, concept that's being taught here, the theological message that's being brought out in this book at this, this stage is the fact that Humans are humans are humans. We have an old sin nature. We are going to fail. Okay? And God is faithful. is going to provide for us. That's the main theme throughout the entire book of Genesis. But we see it over and over again with regard to Abraham. Okay? Or Abram. So first of all, one of the heroes of the Old Testament is human and has an old sin nature. Sin nature. Period. Second, comma, he allows his fear And arrogance to drive him rather than trusting in the Lord, period. This arrogance. Leads to sins of the tongue. And overt sins, etc. So 
So again, another message that we get from Genesis, starting from, of course, from Eve, is the fact that arrogance can lead us to all kinds of other sins. It is the root of the majority of the sins that we commit. The fact that we think we are better than God. We know more than God. We uh, have a better plan than God. Uh, we understand that, well, God may punish it, us, but I'm big enough. I can handle whatever he has to throw out, so I'm going to do whatever I want to do anyway. Right? <laughs> All right? <laughs> you know? The same kind of thing that arrogant children today are doing with regard to their parents. Right? And parents are, are being taught that you can't discipline your kids. And so the, the kids, on, in this case, are actually right. They can do these things, and there isn't a thing the parents can do about them. And that's part of what, you know, get on my soapbox, that's part of what's destroying our country. As, parents, as uh, kids are not being, uh, are not being taught uh, how to fail, they're not being taught how to live within boundaries, they're not being taught how to, uh, how to have morals, uh, and then the lack of morals leads to the lack of courtesy and, and, uh, and uh, civility, and we end up having the kinds of riots and the kinds of activities that we're having. The total disregard for human life. Anyway, this leads to the sins, the sins of the tongue, uh, lying, etc. Okay, and thirdly, comma, that God still deals with him. In justice, or with justice, probably would have been better so it doesn't sound confusing, sound like injustice. Uh, <clears throat> God still deals with him with justice and protects Abram even when Abram is malfunctioning. We see in verse 12, 17, that the Lord punished Pharaoh, that's P-H-A-R-A-O-H, so it's R-A-O-H on the end there, okay, one of the words I misspell a lot, so we see in verse 12, 17, that the Lord punished Pharaoh for his treatment of Sarai, S-A-R-A-I, slant Sarah, period. We also see that the plagues force Abram to return to his proper function proper geographical location so that the Lord can uphold his promises that he made to Abram. See, the idea is that he never should have fled to Egypt in the first place. Okay, when he got there and there was a famine, <laughs> okay, he should, have, he should have said, Lord, you promised me this area, uh, you know, uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> okay. Instead, he's like, uh-oh, we better go down to Egypt. I hear they got stuff down there, right? You know, and so he fled, and then he lied about it and everything else. 
and eventually the Lord, still treating him properly, when Abram finally uh, uh, gets back in proper function, uh, then the Lord actually uh, disciplines Pharaoh, Pharaoh, because Pharaoh shouldn't have taken him in anyway, but the way Pharaoh treats Sarah, uh, Sarai at the time, uh, and, <clears throat> and causes plagues on uh, Egypt, you'd think the Egyptians would, would uh, take that as a warning that maybe next time we don't do the deal with the Jews this way. But uh, anyway, <laughs> there's plagues, and the plagues, of course, force Abram back up to where he was supposed to be. So the cursing gets turned into blessing because he gets back up to the land of promise. Okay. Sub point four, four with two parents around it. So we're in six E. Sub point three, sub point little b. Sub point four, <laughs> four with two parents around it. <clears throat> and I will give you uh, 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 more previews of coming attractions. There's actually ten sub points in this point, so uh, we're almost halfway there. Anyway, sub point four. Then in the next account. Comma, chapter 13, comma. We see that Abram responds. With calm confidence that God is with him, period. So now we're seeing the cycles. You, you see that he uh, trusts God, then he doesn't trust God. Now he's back to trusting God. He has very good uh, confidence. He's got a, a soul uh, that's relaxed, and he's functioning properly. Okay? Uh, so in verse 13, or chapter 13, we see that Abram responds with calm confidence that God is with him, period. The Lord has so prospered Abraham, uh, Abram, I keep wanting to say Abraham, but his name hasn't changed yet. The Lord has so prospered Abram that he and Lot, comma, his nephew, comma, must find separate pasture lands on which to feed their livestock, period. So when he gets back into his right geographical location, just like when we are functioning properly in our right geographical location, when he gets back to his right geographical location and is functioning properly, God gives him prosperity. And uh, he had the prosperity extends to his family, uh, including his nephew, Lot. And, and uh, their flocks have gotten so large that where they're located, uh, it can no longer sustain the size of the flocks that they have. So they're going to have to split up and go to different uh, areas, okay? Uh, because they're they are so prosperous that uh, they just don't have the, uh, the uh, grass in the feed to feed these things. Okay? So <clears throat> the Lord has so prospered Abram that he and Lot, his nephew, must find separate pasture lands on which to feed their livestock. Continue the point. Abram could have grasped at God's promise for land and had the first choice, comma, but instead he allows Lot to choose, period. And there's nothing improper there. God didn't tell, uh, the, didn't tell Abram that he had to choose. Uh, nobody else could choose. So Abram, realizing that, hey, God prospered me, uh, and, I'm going to, and he's been very gracious towards me, I'm going to extend that graciousness, and I'm going to function properly, and I'm going to allow Lot to pick first. Okay, so it's actually a, uh, it actually shows his uh, relaxed mental attitude and his trust in God. Because at this point, he's saying, you know, it doesn't matter 
which land I get, whether Lot picks the best land and I get the, the gravel or what, because God has made a promise and God's going to take care of me. So actually from this uh, decision, you see a proper mental attitude. Okay, So he allows Lot to choose. Lot, of course, continuing the point, Lot, of course, chooses the best land. This is chapter 13, verses 10 and 11. So Lot, of course, chooses the best land, 13, colon, 10 and 11, which was in the region around, you guys can all write it down, because <laughs> you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, S-O-D-O-M, and Gomorrah is G-O-M-O-R-R. A H. There's two R's in Gomorrah. It's so bad you had to have two of them. <laughs> so a lot, of course, chose the best land, which was in the region around Sodom and Gomorrah. Period. Abram does not hesitate, comma. but allows Lot to take this prime land because he now trusts in the Lord To provide for him no matter what the condition of the land, period. And this is the section. where we have the second account of the Abrahamic covenant. Period. So because he, he shows his trust, God reaffirms that you are going to get the promised land. You are going to get land. <clears throat> okay? As a result of Lot's choice, comma, Lot is eventually taken into captivity as a result of a war between neighboring kingdoms which included the kings of both Sodom and Gomorrah, period. One of the, the accounts that you don't hear much about is this war that takes place. Okay, but uh, there is a war, and Lot and you know and his family is taken captive. Okay, uh, Abram, <clears throat> continue the point. Abram had to rely on his trust of the Lord and mounted an army. to retrieve his nephew, comma,
his goods, meaning Lot's goods, and all of his people, period, meaning all family members as well as all servants and slaves. Once again, we see God's faithfulness to Abram. So by functioning properly, and this, this is, a, this is a, you know, a, a, a good message for us, is by functioning properly, you stay out of trouble. <laughs> okay. You, uh, what happened was uh, he, gave, he, he was functioning properly, and he gave Lot the choice of the land. And, and uh, you know, Lot took the best land, and Abram was okay with that because he was functioning properly. He had trust in the Lord. Again, it didn't matter what, uh, whether the ground was gravelly or whatever, that God had said he was going to take care of him, so he trusted that God was going to take care of him. Right? And had he taken the area that Lot took, then he would have been involved in the, uh, the uh, war to the extent that he potentially could have been taken captive. Instead, Lot and his people were all uh, taken captive. And Abram was able to, uh, with the help of the Lord and with his faith in the Lord, was able to uh, mount an army and go and get everybody back. Okay? And as a result, also uh, stop the war, and uh, you end up with Sodom and Gomorrah being city-states again that were, uh, were self-governing, okay? <clears throat> which, of course, was not a good thing, as you know the story of what eventually happened. <laughs> okay? So did I give you the last sentence in there? Once again, we see God's faithfulness. Okay. So point five. Later in the account, comma, See, so here we, here we go again, right? You have this upswing, Lot's functioning. I mean, uh, Abram's functioning really well. He uh, did the right thing by picking the right land. He went and saved, uh, you know, saved Lot and his family and everything, right? And you know, all of a sudden, uh, he's going to fall back down again. Okay, so later in the count, comma, Abram once again shows his lack of confidence in God's ability to fulfill the promises by trying to grasp at the promise of a family in spite of his sexual death, period. Remember, we have seven types of death. The one we're talking about here is sexual death, which means that Abram, at his advanced age at this point in time, is no longer able to, uh, uh, to have any kind of children. He's not, you know, he and Sarah are both past the child birthing ages, if you will. And so when I say trying to grasp at the promise, the idea, the reason I, I picked that word is the idea that he is trying to, once again, like we often do, uh, reach out and take a hold of the situation, to grasp the situation and try and run with it. We try to override God's promises. We try to override God's plan for our life by reaching out and grasping for it ourselves. And so here we have Abram trying to grasp at the promise of a family in spite of sexu his sexual death, period. Abram, continue the point, Abram tries to help God out, period. This is brought out. In Genesis 15.3, when he attempts to adopt a household slave,
See, this, is, this was a, a, a tradition in ancient world, is if you didn't have kids, you could uh, adopt one of your slaves and change their name, and they would end up becoming uh, your heir. That's how we ended up getting uh, Octavius or Augustus Caesar. Augustus Caesar was not in the line of the Caesars. He was adopted. <laughs> okay, so the idea is that's where it, what it happened. So he's he's looking around. He said, you know, God, I know you promised me, uh, you know, uh, uh, progeny that's going to be as numerous as the stars in the sky. Uh, doesn't look like it's happening here. Okay, so I'm going to do something. You know, I'll, I'll help you out. I'm going to adopt a nice young kid here. Okay, and he'll and he'll go ahead and he'll start populating the world and he, and he'll take it over for you so that you can fulfill your promise. Arrogant? What do you think? Yeah, of course. Okay. So he attempts to adopt a household slave. And then in chapter 16, so this is brought out in Genesis 15, 3, where he attempts to adopt a household slave. And then in chapter 16, where he mates with one of Sarai's slave girls. And Sarai is S-A-R-A-I, and that's uh, Sarah's name before her name is changed. Jack always used to like to say her name, Sarai, means contentious bitch, so she must have been a real nice wife to be with. You can imagine when, uh, when uh, God tells him to, you know, to choose the land and he gives Lot the, other, you know, the, 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 the opportunity to choose and, he, and he, you know, Lot takes the best, you can imagine Sarai in the background going, why'd you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Our sheep could have had that land. <laughs> you know, anyway, he attempts uh, where he mates with one of Sarai's slave girls, comma, Hagar, H-A-J, I mean H-A-G-A-R, Hagar, period. <clears throat> this later becomes a male name for a Viking in the comic strips. But anyway, <laughs> Hagar, anyway, H-A-G-A-R. Theologically, comma, Sarai, represents the, quote, covenant of grace, end quote, semicolon. Mm -hmm. Theologically, Sarai represents the, quote, covenant of grace, end quote, semicolon. Whereas Hagar... represents the, quote, covenant of the law, end quote. Hyphen, which bears children who are to be slaves, period. Galatians 4, 24 through 28. See, Sarai represents the covenant of grace because she's the one that uh, God is going to eventually uh, grace, and she will, excuse me, have the proper son of promise, uh, whereas Hagar is the covenant of the law because what happened? You have Abram trying to uh, use the laws of the ancient Near East to try and have children, and what ultimately happens is these children end up being slaves. Okay. <clears throat> Continue the point. This is the line, in other words, uh, Abram, is successful in his uh, impregnation of Hagar, and she has a child, okay? This is the line of Ishmael, I-S-H-M-A-E-L. This is the line of Ishmael, who is the father of the Arabs, and the arch enemies to the Jews, to this day. A 
eventually Abram under divine direction sends Hagar and Ishmael away and starts to function properly according to God's plan. So we had high, a low, high, a low. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Subpoint six. Six with two parents around it. I promise this one's not going to be as long as point five. Subpoint so six. God continues to come to Abram. to confirm his intentions. Yes, capital H. To confirm his intentions, capital H, to fulfill his promises. Capital H in both cases, period. But God also foretells That Abram's progeny will not have it easy, semicolon. They will be enslaved for 400 years, period. This will be a time in which they will be prepared to be turned into a nation and not just a people, period. So God tells him, look, I, I told you you're going to have, the, you know, you're gonna have all of these uh, uh, descendants. I didn't promise that they were going to have an easy life. Uh, it's going to be tough. They're going to end up being enslaved for 400 years. Uh, part of the reason why, of course, is because they have the same old, nat old sin nature strain that Abram has. <laughs> they, they trust, and then they don't trust, and then they trust, and then they don't trust, right? And so they end up going into slavery for 400 years. Of course, that's the slavery under the Egyptians. Uh, that is where they finally come out under Moses. Okay, but the idea is that they are going to be enslaved. And so he's telling, you know, he's telling Abram, don't expect that it's just going to be uh, uh, gravy, right? And that's what we have to understand as well is that even though we are believers, it doesn't mean our life is going to be a bowl of cherries, if you like cherries or whatever, okay? Uh, the idea is that, is that we have to function properly no matter what the circumstances are around us. And that's what he's telling Abram. His people are going to have to function properly despite the uh, circumstances around them. And so we start seeing some of these very basic concepts that we understand uh, being formed in this very first book. Okay. Point seven. Point seven is going to be a long one, but we'll get through it. <clears throat> point seven. Because I didn't want to subdivide it into, you know, some point a little A with parents around it or whatever. <laughs> okay. So point seven. By waiting until Abraham and Sarah... We're sexually dead.
to give them a child, comma, by waiting until Abraham and Sarah were sexually dead to give them a child, comma, God demonstrates that this child is truly a divine gift and the child of promise. This promise is double-edged in that it is the promise to Abraham for a son and four descendants, comma, Descendant is spelled with an A. It's D-E-S-C-E-N-D-A-N-T-S. I always want to do E-N-T-S, but it's not. It's A-N-T-S. So for those of you that don't have spell checker. <clears throat> okay, this promise is double-edged in that it is the promise to Abraham for a son and for descendants, comma, but it is also a promise... to mankind... for an eventual savior, savior. <clears throat> of course, again, previews of coming attractions here. We see this because Isaac is a foreshadow of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And remember, Isaac means little after because when uh, the angel came to Abraham, and said that he was going to have a son, and he and uh, uh, Sarah were both barren, if you will. They were sexually dead. Uh, Sarah was not supposed to be listening in, but she was eavesdropping, okay, uh, being one of those kind of women, <laughs> okay? She wanted to know exactly what was going on, right? You know, didn't trust her husband, all that kind of stuff, right? And so the angel's talking privately, quote, unquote, with Abraham and telling him that he's going to have a son, and Sarah hears it, and she starts laughing. Because she knows there's no way, in, in, you know, in, 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 there was no way that she was going to be able to have a child. Uh, she starts laughing. So when uh, she becomes pregnant and gives birth to Isaac, uh, he's named Isaac because that's a little after to make, uh, you know, uh, make the account of her laughing a uh, issue. Okay. So, <clears throat> but it's also promised to mankind for an eventual savior. Continue the point. After the birth of Isaac, and Isaac is with two A's, I S A A C. After the birth of Isaac, comma, Abraham, comma, whose name was changed just prior to the birth, comma, demonstrates that he has at last come to a profound trust in God's willingness and power to fulfill his promises. See, this is when he's finally become mature enough. It took him to get this old, okay? This is when he's finally become mature enough that God can fulfill the promise. This is the, this is the apex, if you will, of uh, Abram's faith. He's finally gotten to the point where he goes, okay, I understand. You've told me to go to this land, and I did that, but uh, you led me to some place I didn't trust you, and so I went to Egypt. That turned out to be horrible. <laughs> okay, I got out of there. Uh, you let me pick land for the, uh, for the sheep. Uh, that was great. 
uh, although I had to fight a war. Uh, but then, but then I, you know, fell back out and wavered again, uh, and then by by worrying about whether I was going to have a descendant or not, and I messed up there, and now I'm back in, and you finally, uh, you know, I'm finally mature enough to really have enough trust that this is exactly what's going to happen, and it happens, right? And Isaac is born. So <clears throat> we have. After the birth of Isaac, Abraham, whose name was changed as part of the birth, demonstrates that he has at last come to profound trust in God's willingness and power to fulfill his promise, promises. This is then manifest in the account of the, quote, sacrifice of Isaac, period, end quote. See, Abram, or Abraham now, would never have had, if he hadn't grown, if he hadn't uh, gone through those other experiences uh, to, to uh, grow to the point that he is mature enough that when God says, take this son, this son of promise, the son that was miraculously given to you because you and your wife were sexually dead, and go up and sacrifice him. And Abram doesn't plead like he did with Lot, right? Remember, he, uh, he uh, tried to negotiate with God, uh, you know, down to uh, saving uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, if you have 50 people in there, will you save it? If you have 10, if you, you know, if you have 30, if you have 20, if you have 10, right? You know, and he miscounted because he thought Lot's wife was a believer when, in fact, she wasn't, okay? And so, the, of course, Sodom and Gomorrah weren't, weren't uh, saved. But you had the Lot, he tried to negotiate. He doesn't try to negotiate. He doesn't try to say, well... How about uh, instead of Isaac, we go and I go find Ishmael. We'll take care of it. You know? <laughs> or, or how about, uh, uh, you know, how about not? Here's an idea, Lord. <laughs> yeah, no. like, like Peter would have done when Peter was an immature believer, right? So this shows the maturity of Abram, okay? Here's his only son, and he's told to go sacrifice him, okay? So manifest in the account of the, quote, sacrifice of Isaac, period, end quote. Of course, it's in quotes because Isaac doesn't get sacrificed, but that's what it's called. Uh, I think last time I taught this, when I taught the story about it, when I went through the uh, uh, example of Abraham, when, we were, and when Abraham was being used as an example of a hero, remember we had a couple different heroes that were brought out, uh, and I had a really cool picture of, of uh, you know, Isaac on the rock and Abraham with the knife, and then you have the angel, you know, <laughs> and it was really cool. Anyway, <clears throat> sacrifice of Isaac. This event marked the pinnacle in Abraham's spiritual existence. Hebrews 11, 17 through 19. This, comma, The greatest crises in the patriarch's life, comma, was made possible by three others. which were foundational and preparatory, colon. Sure, this, the greatest crises in the patriarch's life, you got patriarch? Yep. Okay. It was made possible by three others, which were foundational and preparatory. P-R-E-P-A-R-A-T-O-R-Y. Colon. First, comma, his leaving of his country and his family. Genesis 12, 1, semicolon.
second, comma, his separation from Lot, comma, a possible heir, and fellow believer. Genesis 13, 5 through 18. And 2 Peter 2, 7 and 8. Semicolon. And third, his final rejection of his own plan and hopes for Ishmael. Genesis 17, 17 and 18, period. So it's through those three key, uh, you know, those three key uh, <clears throat> progressions that you can see, uh, you can see Abraham maturing. You can see him maturing through all the others too, but I picked those three as uh, the key three points that allows him to finally get to the point where he has enough trust in God that he can say, okay, fine. I will take my son up, and uh, in, uh, in Hebrews, uh, the, the, uh, in the book of Hebrews, we're told that Abraham uh, thinks that, well, you know, maybe he's going to be resurrected. All right, I'm going to kill him, and, and uh, God's going to resurrect him and show me the greatness of resurrection, or something, because <laughs> God made me a promise, and I'm now smart enough to understand that uh, God keeps his promises, and therefore I'm going to do what he tells me, and we'll see uh, what happens, Okay. So uh, he had to go through those growth stages, just like we end up having to go through growth stages where we get lumps on our heads. And we finally have to say, you know what, God? Uh, that's right. <laughs> You've promised these things. And if I would just get out of my own way and allow you to take care of them, then I would have fantastic blessings. And therefore, I am going to get out of my own way. I'm going to, as we're studying in rebound, I'm going to rebound. I'm going to uh, forget. Uh, you know, I'm going to isolate my sins, I'm going to forget them, and I'm going to function properly, and when you tell me to do this, I'm going to do it. And I'm not going to try and add to it, I'm not going to try and take away from it, I'm not going to try and negotiate, <laughs> I'm going to do what you tell me to do, and I'm going to have the blessings that you want to give me. Okay? And we're only halfway through point, uh, point seven, but unfortunately, that's where we are going to have to stop and where we will end up picking it up in the middle of the point next week. I want to color coat this guy real quick so I can find it easily next week. There we go. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to once again be able to continue to study the Old Testament, continue to study your fantastic faithfulness and the things that you've provided for the, quote, heroes of the Old Testament and understand that you are continuing to function in that faithfulness towards us as we move forward in our daily walk with you. And we ask now, then, that God the Holy Spirit make sure that we understand this and that we continue to use it in our proper function on a daily basis. And we pray in Christ's name. Amen.